Welcome to Family Bible Time. We're in Job 9. Job chapter 9. Wow. This is quite a chapter. Mm. There's some there's some verses in the Bible that you just um they're like key verses uh, in the whole Bible. And Job 9 has one of them. It's really interesting. Maybe two. And we're also in Romans 13. Romans 13, all about God and government and other juicy things. So let's turn that thing over. Let's pray and let's go. Lord, we thank you for your word and again praise you for the privilege of studying it day by day. Lord, we uh, confess that we need it. We need you above all things. Please teach us. Please lead us in truth. Please strengthen us today to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Then Job answered and said, who was he answering by the way? Bildad the shoe height. What was Bildad's argument based on? Tradition. Tradition. What was Eliphaz's argument based on? Experience. Revelation. Experience. Revelation. So Eliphaz says, oh, the angel. So oh. My hair stood on end, a spirit passed me in the night, and this is what you need to know, Job. And it was all nonsense, wasn't it? And then Bildad the Shuhite said, you know, think about the ancients and the people. We're, we're nobody, but they, they, everyone's known this. Mm. This is the traditional view. Mm, right, and it was a whole lot of help, wasn't it? Anyway, mm. Job answered. Then Job answered and said, Truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could answer. One could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? He who removes mountains and they know it not. He, when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble who commands the sun and it does not rise, who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea, who made the bear and the and Orion, Plady, the Pleiades and the chambers of the south, who does great things beyond searching out and marvellous things beyond number. Behold, he passes me by and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. Behold, he snatches away. Who can turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? God will not turn turn back his anger. Beneath him bowed the helpers of Rahab. Whatever that means. How then can I answer him? Choosing my words with him. Though I am in the right, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. If I summon him and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice, but he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not let me get my breath, but fills me with bitterness. You see, Job feels like he's just getting one blow after another, and it's like he's in a fight and he can't even catch his breath before the next trouble comes. Terrible business. If it is a contest of strength, behold, he is mighty. If it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am in the right, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I am blameless, he would prove me perverse. I am blameless, I regard not myself, I loathe my life. It is all one, therefore I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. See, Job's despairing now, isn't he? When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked and covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, who then is it? My days are swifter than a runner. They flee away, they see no good. They go by like skiffs of reed. There's really swift boats, swift light boats. 
like an eagle swooping on the prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face and be of good cheer. I become afraid of all my suffering, for I know that you will not hold me innocent. I shall be condemned. Why then do I labour in vain? If I wash myself with snow, if I clean and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into a pit. My own clothes will abhor me. For he is not a man as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There is no arbiter. <laughs> there is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. Mm -hmm. Let him not, let him take his rod away from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. And then I would speak without fear of him, for I am not so in myself. Mm. Poor Job, mm. such a terrible business, isn't it? Poor old Job, he's, he's kind of complaining about his situation. He's complaining that God is just so other, so different, so high and right and perfect and just and everything that he can't, how can he come, how can he be right before God? That's how it opens, isn't it? Verse 2, truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? So he's saying that you're accusing me of sin, I, I know it's not, how can someone be completely right before God. And then he asks this question in verse 33. There's no arbiter, there's no arbiter between us. Try saying that ten times fast. There is no arbiter between us. Arbiter between. Anyway, or would that that's... there were, right? Say again? Or would that there were. Exactly. See the footnote. Would that there were. An arbiter, arbiter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't say it. <laughs> we laugh too much. It's your turn. <laughs> uh, so, would that there were an arbiter between us? <laughs> oh, but this is really getting to the heart of the problem, isn't it? Because what, what does every sinner need? We can't argue against God's justice, can we? If God sends us to hell, we've got not one word we can say in defense. Do you remember in the story that Jesus told about the, the, the wedding feast and the man who gets in and the, the, the master of the feast says, Friend, how did you come in here without a garment? take him outside and he was thrown out and it says the man was speechless uh -huh. like, you've got no defence you're in the wedding but you didn't accept the wedding garment from the host it's almost like a... come on really, <laughs> the meowy cat is I'm feeling sure. left out so here's the deal how are you going to be right in the sight of God? That's the deal, isn't it? That's the question. How can we be truly right? Job's saying, even though, even though I, I am blameless, he could find wrong. He could find things wrong with me, and that's true, isn't it? Even if you've not, even if you're not guilty of unrepentant sin, you've still got enough sin to send you to hell forever. So, what's, what's the answer? Well, the answer is an arbiter. What's an arbiter? An arbiter is someone who goes between two people who have a dispute. So sometimes in, like, in trade, two people will be in a trade dispute and they'll say, oh, you know, we, you promised to supply all this all these materials for us for so much and now you're you're not making it fulfilling your promise and some the other person will say oh well no you did this and so on and then they'll have an arbiter they've got a dispute they'll have an arbiter who's like a someone who's going to 
decide between the two people who's going to look at both sides of it. So this is interesting, isn't it? Job's saying, oh, I need someone who can see where I'm at. And because like, God is just so holy and so powerful, who can argue with him? I, I, don't, know, I don't know how. What, I wish there was someone who could just stand up for me. Oh, 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 but there is, isn't there? God fixed this. God sent his son. God sent the one and only Jesus to be born as a baby, to grow up as a human, to live like we live, without sin, but to be tempted in every point, just as we are, but without sin. And God appointed him to be a merciful high priest so he could, he's actually touched, he's actually moved with a feeling of sympathy for our weakness, our infirmities. He, he looks at us and he feels for us. And, and, and then we're told that he's a great, our great high priest and he, and he ever lives in heaven to intercede for us. And so if you're ever feeling like, oh, but God is so holy and so powerful and who can argue with him and who's going to stick up for me? Who understands me? Well, obviously God understood you because God knows everything. But to prove it to us, to show it to us, he came and lived just like us. Mm. And you can't say he doesn't know. And you can't say he doesn't care. He does know and he does care. And if it's conceivable for you, if you can think about this, Jesus, God the Son, is our arbiter with God the Father. So, yeah, who can be right before God? We can't, can we? But Jesus says, I'm giving them my righteousness. I died in their place. And he prays for us. Why? Well, <laughs> that's amazing, isn't it? Job 9 has been answered by God. Wow. Anyway, I think, I think it's pretty cool. Mm. Do you think it's pretty cool? Mm -hmm. I hoped you would. <laughs> when do you feel like you need this? When do you feel like you need this? Well, Donna's been going through some of our old books. She just found a journal that I wrote back in 1998 mm -hmm. when we were in Papua New Guinea. And the Lord was dealing with my soul and brought me at last to the point where I, I felt like I was able to really come into his presence and 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 pray and rejoice in his love for me and, and really accept and understand and, and kind of know that he'd forgiven me and I knew I, think I was saved before then but I'd lost sight of that and I couldn't ever really pray without realizing oh but my sin and he's so holy and he's so other and he's so different and mm. My sin, my sin is just always there. Mm. And then, oh, well, if he's paid for my sin, and he's also given me his righteousness, so that he looks upon me as righteous, then because of Jesus, because of my arbiter, I'm acceptable to him. So I can pray to him as my heavenly father can actually ask him, knowing that he loves me. Oh, it was a very, very wonderful moment in my life. And I think knowing that you have an arbiter, someone who speaks to the Father on your behalf, mm. someone who wants the best for you, is really something, isn't it? Mm. Oh, yeah. Romans chapter 13. <coughs> Mm. 
This is totally different. Mm -hmm. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. And would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Well, then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes, to whom taxes are owed. Revenue, to whom revenue is owed. Respect, to whom respect is owed. Honour, to whom honour is owed. Where do you think Paul got all of that from? Of course, it's from Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Jesus who said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. And it's like, pay your taxes. Anyway, <laughs> owe nothing to anyone except to love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not Oh, did I get that the wrong way around? The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, you could read the word season there, that the hour has come for you to wake up, wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarrelling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Wow, okay. Well, there's so much here for us. It's really hard to decide where to go, <laughs> what to focus on. Well, first of all, let's just look at verses 1 to 7. 1 to 7. You know, think about this for a minute. Christians are supposed to be, here it says, subject to the governing authorities. So we're supposed to submit ourselves voluntarily, willingly, to those who are the authorities in government, let's say. And the reason is given in verse 1, 4, that's the, introducing the reason, there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. 
Now, to stop there for a second, you realise, don't you, that God is anti-anarchy. God is... So anarchy is like rejecting all law and order, rejecting all external authority. An anarchist is someone who says, I'm free to do whatever I like. I just want to be able to do anything I like. I don't want anyone telling me what to do. And God is against that. God instituted, God appointed authority. And those two words are used here. Those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. So let's just be clear. You don't like it when someone's telling you what to do. And that's because you're a rebel, okay? But that doesn't give you the right to throw off that external authority. As a Christian, you must submit yourself to authority. That's very plain. Um, he goes on to say, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of authority? Of the one who's in authority, then do what is good. So in other words, look, you're supposed to do good, and the authorities, um, you don't have to be afraid of them, because they're there to punish those who do evil. That's actually the purpose of the instituted authorities by God, is to reward those who do good and to punish those who do evil. And to punish those who do evil, they have a sword. The sword, as has been pointed out, is not for smacking you on the bottom with. The sword is for capital punishment. So the, the governments that exist have this power to punish evil doing and with everything up to and including capital punishment, the death penalty. Anyway, um, verse 4 describes them as the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And then verse 5 applies it again and says, Therefore one must be in subjection. Not only to avoid God's wrath. In other words, if you, if you ig ignore the authorities, you will incur God's wrath. You just reject authority like that. But also for the sake of conscience. You don't want to be sinning against your own conscience. Okay. Um... And then he applies it to taxes. For the same reason also you pay taxes. Why? Because the authorities are ministers of God. Attending to this very thing. You say, what? So my taxes that I have to pay are to the authorities, but they're God's ministers? Yes. They're the ones who have the responsibility of upholding law and order in society. And believe me, you don't want law and order to break down. That's, that's the fundamental underlying principle that you can come away with from this. God is, is for authority, for law, for order. And, and that re that's the reason we pay taxes, because, because governments are there to to uphold that and we we can't sidestep that now bear in mind he's quoting jesus and jesus even agreed think about this think about how bizarre and, and perplexing this must have been for the jews but jesus agreed with giving with paying taxes to caesar Caesar was the occupying power in Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem belonged to the Jews. But the Romans were there as an occupying force. And 
Jesus said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar, and to Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. Paul says to the Romans, pay your taxes. That means paying taxes to Caesar. That means supporting the existence of the Roman Empire. You're like, but it's wicked. Nero's in control. They're all corrupt. Yes. The alternative is anarchy. You say, well, shouldn't we join behind? Shouldn't there be like a revolution to get rid of that and to bring in a, a better form of government? Shouldn't Christians be Christians know how to govern things better, don't they? Sure, and so did the Jews, didn't they? The Jews had God's law, didn't they, in Israel? But there's never a movement set up by Jesus to kick out the Romans and to bring in the the, the bring in his own reign. Even I mean, he was the king of the Jews. He could have run things much better, couldn't he? Well, he's he's going to come back and he's going to run things much better. But in the meantime, he wants his followers to submit to those in authority, not to join in efforts to overthrow it all, and to pay your taxes and to and to just. I mean, the focus here is all all on. Um, you know, pay your taxes, be a good citizen, and get on with loving one another. Look at verse 8. Owe oh, nothing to anyone ex except to love one another. Um, this is really, really helpful. Because now the focus immediately comes back from, okay, you've got to be submissive citizens, pay your taxes, don't, don't be don't be trying to avoid that um, authority structure that's in society, and the focus is then on okay your relationship to one another as Christians. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Verse ten. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law, and and then look at what he says in verse eleven. Besides this. You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Look, the end is coming, says Paul to the Romans. Don't panic about trying to gain positions in the Roman Senate and sway things in the right way. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. And then he draws attention to something which is the great enemy of Christianity. And it's not, okay, oh, the political powers, it's mm -hmm. let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immor immorality and sensuality, not in quarrelling and jealousy. Mm. Let's just be straight about things. Those are far greater enemies of Christianity than any persecuting government can be. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. All right. A couple of words and we're done. So first of all, yes, I do understand, I do know, in case someone's tempted to remind me, that we can't submit to the governments if they're telling us to sin. So if the government says you can't meet to worship, we say, hold on a minute, in the Bible it says don't give up gathering together. It says we have to worship. If the government says you can't sing, you're not allowed to sing, we say, well, but we're commanded in the Bible to sing. If the government says you can't preach, we say, sorry, sorry chum. <laughs> Who do you think we should obey, you or God? I mean, choose for yourself. But if you want to say you, we're just going to say you're wrong. <laughs> because we have to obey God. We can't not obey God. We can't say, if you say we have to worship this idol, Yah, boo, be it known to you, 
that we will not bow. <laughs> That's it. That's what we have to say, right? But, but obviously, there is at the same time a command here for us to be subject to the authorities, not to resist them. And, and we have to work that out. And I, I realize it's more complicated than I've been able to put into a few words. There's a lot here that we do need to, to think about. Um, there's a lot of interesting and difficult details to work out. But in our working out of the details, we can't override what is written here. And we can't also override what's written in the book of Acts for us, that we, we must obey God and not men. We have to work that out carefully. That's the difficult um, job of every Christian, especially in, the, in an age when governments are not rewarding those who do good. And the they seem to punish those who do good, and they seem to reward people who do evil. And you're like, what, what's going on? Okay, um, we have to work this out. But we have to accept what's written here first and start there. So that's one, one thing to note before the sand runs out. Another thing to note before the sand runs out is the last verse of this chapter, which is awesome. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is a one verse wonder. If you want to know, I see it. If you want to know how to deal with your tendency to sin, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with falling into the same temptation again and again? What do you say to a young man who just keeps going back to look at pornography? Or, or a young woman who keeps falling into sexual sin or who keeps falling into gossip or whatever it is, lust or jealousy or pride. Someone who keeps thinking about themselves all the time and they're just, how do you deal with that? As a Christian, well, here's a one, word, one verse wonder. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is half of the solution. You cannot ignore it. You have to put on Christ. What does it mean to put on Christ? Well, it means drawing near to him. It means learning about him. It means meditating upon him. It means thinking about Jesus. It means learning his his ways, his learning his commands, and, and it's all that's involved in reading and studying the Bible and filling your mind with Christ. Put on Christ. Like you put on your clothes in the morning. Don't get dressed and go about your day without putting on Christ and thinking about Christ. That's immersing yourself in Jesus, drawing near to Jesus. Okay, that's half of the thing. But how do you deal with these temptations? Well, you, you don't deal with it by forgetting to do that. <laughs> so you go to your Bible, immerse yourself in the Lord. Okay, the other half of it is making no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So your sinful flesh has desires. Your flesh says, I want, and whatever it is, fill in the blank. I want um, comfort. I want comfort. I want comfort. Well, um, comfort's not wrong in and of itself, but it can be sinfully wrong, can't it? You can want comfort to the point where it's an idol. What about, I want sex? Well, your flesh says, I want sex, but you're not married. You don't have, you don't have the capacity to... To have that in a way which is not sinful. What do you do with those desires? Okay, those they're desires, but you make no provision for them. You make no provision for them. That means not providing what's necessary in order to get those desires fulfilled for yourself, to gratify the desires. 
So if it's sex and you feel a strong desire for it, you, you don't do the things that would be necessary to make it possible. So you don't, this is like Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 8, where, where Solomon told his son, look, don't go near the door of her house, talking about the, the, the wicked woman. And you could go near her house. And why not go near the door of her house? Well, because you might go in. Your flesh will say, I want to go. I, I, I want to be with her. I'm, I'm not going to go in. I'm just going to go by the door of her house. And then you'll weaken at the last minute and then you'll go in. But it's the same way with our flesh. If you're struggling with eating too much, um, don't go and stand in front of the fridge with it open. Don't go near the fridge. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You don't, don't go and sort of stare in the cupboard. Don't walk up and down the sweet aisle in the supermarket. That's just silly. If you're struggling with those things. If you're struggling with alcohol, don't touch a drop. Don't give yourself even a little tiny bit if you've got a problem with it. Because you're, you're, you're making provision. Don't buy any. You're making provision to gratify its desires. And so this is saying, keep yourself away from those things. Well, that's the other half of this solution. It's a one verse wonder, but the, f the first half is draw near to Christ, put on Christ. The second half is say no, don't provide for, don't gratify your desires. Okay, really simple. It's changed the lives of many, many people, so don't miss it. All right, let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to put on you, Lord Jesus Christ, and that we would continually clothe ourselves with you and um, have you filling our minds and um, directing us and everything about you would characterize us, Lord. We pray for that and we pray that you'd also help us to say no to the flesh to even not pro make provision for it not give it what it wants in any way in jesus name amen, amen. all right god bless you we'll see you god willing tomorrow for romans 14 and job 10 oh, wow. it just goes so quickly doesn't it bye-bye for now god bless you